Hello and welcome to worship. It's great to have you with us. Today we're going to be going into our sanctuary for our sermon message. And I call this Back to the Future. And what I mean by that is we're going to go back to some messages that we have shared in the past and we're going to bring that to you right now in the present and prepare for our ministry in the future as we get back into the sanctuary here shortly. For our call to worship today, I'd like to invite you to share together with me by reading out loud, maybe even shouting out loud, our call to worship. And if you would, declare the words that are written in the bold on your screen. Welcome, friends, to this holy day. We come to offer thanks. We come to sing and pray. Welcome, friends, to this time set apart. A time to remember those we love. A time to remember the holy promises of God. Welcome, friends, to this time of remembrance and joy. Let us embrace God's love and let us seek to love everyone always. Let us worship God. Let us recite our words of witness together. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, goodness, and love, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, who for us and our salvation lived and died and rose again and lives evermore, and in the Holy Spirit, who takes the things of Christ 
and reveals them to us, renewing, comforting, and inspiring our souls. We are united in striving to know the will of God as taught in the Holy Scriptures and in our purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord, made known or to be made known to us. Amen. today, I'd like to invite you to share together with me a prayer that St. Ignatius of Loyola taught. He's the founder of the Jesuit order in the Catholic Church, a man of deep devotion, a person that taught about engaging in scripture in a way that enhances our intimacy with Jesus. And I've been using this little Pray As You Go app that I have on my phone. And you can also go to Pray As You Go online on your, uh, on your computer, on your desktop, or on your, your basic um, uh, tabletop computer. And this Pray As You Go application has been put together by the Jesuits. And they, they have this wonderful focused readings of scripture in the great tradition of Lectio Divina, where you read the scripture slowly, you reflect on it, and then you read it again and reflect on it even more, and you apply it to your life personally. And as I was doing that about a week ago, actually, on the feast day of Ignatius of Loyola, I decided to look into his ministry a little bit more, and Cindy was looking into his ministry, and she found this beautiful prayer of St. Ignatius, and um, Cindy shared it with the church in her family newsletter, and I'd, I'd, I'd just love to share it together with you today, and for us to declare it. It has just been so meaningful to Cindy and me, and I'd invite you to um, share it in prayer today. Uh, and in committing it to memory, I, I like to go back to kind of techniques that I use in teaching things to children, just hand motions. And, and I even like to use the hand motions for this prayer that I've developed myself. The prayer goes like this. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. I ask only for your love and grace that would be enough for me. Would you say that together with me? You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and grace. That is enough for me. Let us pray together. Lord God, as we think of your love and grace, we recognize that you do give us your love and grace. You provide it in so many beautiful ways. You are our creator, and you give us the very breath that we breathe. And you are our redeemer. And through the blood of Christ on the cross, you have paid for the sins that we have committed and that we will ever commit. And you have restored us to the potential of right relationship with you. You also give us potential for right relationships with one another. And so help us to respond to your love and grace, Lord, by loving everyone always. God, for this world, we pray your blessings. Help our love for this world to be demonstrated in the ways that we treat 
one another on a personal level, even those people living in homes together with us, those people that we see behind the masks as we stop in the grocery store to pick up food, uh, those that we see walking down the street. Um, we just pray for this world and this world in need for the victims of fire, for the victims of disease, for the victims of persecution, for those who are distressed internally, we pray your blessing and your peace. God, thank you for the joy that you bring into our lives through your Holy Spirit. Please work by your Spirit's ways in the life of our church family and in all those that we love and help us to bring about righteousness social righteousness and, and grace in this world, as you would like to see. We pray for everyone in this world who is feeling marginalized, who is feeling like they do not have the freedoms that others have. God, might we find freedom in Christ, and might we celebrate that with all your people everywhere. We pray this, Lord Jesus, and ask that we would reflect this day and always more and more, the very character of Jesus. So we pray this in his name. And we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, I'm going to be sharing together with you my message that is an introduction to the book of 1 Corinthians. This is the letter from Paul to the church in Corinth that contains the famous love chapter of the Bible. And today, I want to read for you the very opening of that letter from Paul's 1 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 1. Verse 4, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all kinds of knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into a fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your mind and in your thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Cleo's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Still another says, I follow Cephas. And then there are others that say, oh, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except for Crispus and, and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. 
Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas, but beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Now, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, I pray that these words that come from the Apostle Paul to our ears today would be filled with your spirit anew so that as we listen to your word written once, it becomes your word afresh to us now. Speak to our hearts, we pray, in Jesus' name, and shape our lives for the sake of Christ. Amen. This past week, I sent out an email in our Tower Tidings, and we also mailed it out. Um, I shared in my pastor's report in our Tower Tidings about our new theme that we're looking at for this Pentecost season. The theme is love everyone always. And where I picked up the words for this theme is really from Scripture, but the way that it's phrased, I, I was um, introduced to it by my grandson. He's two years old. And I was going to his house. I was very excited to see my grandson. It was Memorial Day. My wife had already been there for five days. And I was joining them immediately after worship on that Sunday before Memorial Day. And I pull up to his parents' house. And there in their yard is this placard posted that has in small letters the name of their church where my grandson goes to church and his parents take him. And in the small corner is that name of the church, but in big letters is the word love. And then under that, everyone, always. And I thought, what a beautiful way to express what the Apostle Paul is saying in his letter to the Corinthians. Love everyone always. I can think of no better message to be a banner over my grandson's life than that one right there. Love everyone always. I can think of no better message for our children that come up here to sing and who sit in our pews and who are partying, preparing for the summer right now. No end of the year party here. Just the beginning of the summer, right? Because God's work continues. We don't take a break from God's work. And God is going to do some new things in Christ's church here this summer. And I can think of no better message for our children here in this church than this one. Love everyone, always. And I think there's no better theme for our own lives than to love everyone always. Can you do better than that? This is what the Bible is all about. God is love. For God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus. And Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love and the greatest commandment is that we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. It's all about love. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, love even your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And when Paul begins to write his letter to the church in Corinth, he knows that this is a church that needs to learn about this central message of love. Because Jesus had demonstrated love in so much of what he did. Jesus said this. He said, greater love hath no man than this, that he would die for his friends. And he says, I call you my friends. And then Jesus demonstrated that kind of love when he went to the cross for us. We're told in the book of Romans, chapter 5, that even while we were sinners, Christ loved us so much that Christ died for us. 
And in the book of Philippians, we're told that Jesus humbled himself. He took on the form of a servant, and he died for us. And it's only in that loving humility that God then lifted him up to a place of glorification that every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord, the glory of God the Father. We can do no better than to love everyone always. And the church in Corinth needed this message. And we need this message. Everyone needs this message. Love. Everyone. Always. Can we do any better than that? I don't think so. And so he writes this letter, what we call the first letter of the Corinthians. Now, we know this is not the first literal letter because in this letter he refers to another letter that he sent and he might have sent others. But we call this 1 Corinthians and that because we also have a 2 Corinthians and that probably wasn't the second letter he wrote. He probably wrote some other ones too, maybe a third and a fourth. But these are the two that we have that are remaining for us and that we have recorded in the Christian canon. And they're all about love And one of the things that's so important to Paul is that we gain our sense of love from Jesus because Jesus is the very embodiment of love. Jesus is love in the flesh. And so everything that Paul says is all about Jesus. He says, I've been chosen by Jesus. He says, you've been called out by Jesus. He says, the people around you have been called out by Jesus. And then in verse 3 and verse 4 and verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 7 and verse 8 and verse 9, he says, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And as he repeats his message about Jesus, he tells us over and over again that it's through Jesus that we have grace and truth. It's through Jesus that we have been given any hope for the future. It's through Jesus that we've been given gifts that we can even dare love like Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And in fact, every time you see the word love in his letter to the Corinthians, you could substitute the word Jesus. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus is not envious and boastful. Jesus hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. Jesus never ends. Because when we get to know the very embodiment of Jesus, the very embodiment of love itself, then we see it in Jesus. 3,500 times in the Bible, I count this message of love, loving everyone, being compassionate, being merciful, being gracious. And the reason that we gather in worship on a regular basis, and the reason that we lift up the name of Jesus and sing songs about Jesus and, and worship him is because we want to be like him. And there's many forces in the world around us that will take our minds off of Jesus and take us to a place that's not loving. And this is exactly what happened in the church of Corinth. He says, something is happening where there's a divisiveness among you and a divisiveness, and there's troubles among you. And those who are responsible for the troubles are just like ripping the very body of Christ apart. You're tearing the body of Christ. And he says, and you're doing it with good intents. You think that that you've got good values about you. But I want to tell you, you're committed to things, but you're not committed to to the greatest thing, which is Jesus, and to his command that we love everyone, always. He says, some in the church in Corinth were what you might call loyalists. And he says, some of you are Paul people. You're my people. You're my devotees. And I'm sure that that was a 
pretty heady experience for him, at least when he first thought about it. But he says, I don't want you to be my people. I know I baptized you and you, and I know, I, well, yeah, there was you and you I baptized, but for the most part, I'm kind of glad now that I didn't baptize every single one of you because then you'd all be becoming my groupies, and I don't want you to be my groupies, he says. I want you to be followers of Jesus. So don't be loyalists to me, Paul says. Be chief loyalists to Jesus. That's fundamentally and primarily important. I have a friend, a um, man that became a friend and, and um, now um, is, 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 a, is a great uh, a resource to the broader church, but he was a pastor in a church in La Cañada, and he taught one of my classes at Fuller Seminary when I was there. So he came in and taught this one class, but he was primarily a pastor, a fellow by the name of Gary Demarest. Some of you know Gary. One of the things Gary told us in our ministry class is that when he was a young minister, just having completed his seminary, he was called as an associate pastor to a large congregation. And after about six months in this church, one of the leaders of the church invited him over to their house. And he thought he was going to go there, have a little dessert, maybe a little meal or something. He gets there, there's 20 people all in the living room. And they announced to him, we want to get rid of the old goat. That's a senior minister. And we're going to request your help. And you, all you have to do is just work with us, and we'll put you in as a senior minister. Now, that was a pretty heady experience for him for about two seconds. But he thought about it. And, and the Spirit gave him a better idea. He says, I'll have no part to do with that. I'm leaving right now. I'm not going to be a part of this. So he left. He contacted the minister. And he said, look, we're not a loyalty campaign here. But this church is all about Jesus. I don't want your loyalty. I want your loyalty to Jesus. It's about him. Some people will wind up making it about people. It's not about people, it's about God. It's about opening ourselves to his Holy Spirit. Now Paul also said some people are more committed to style than there are to specific loyalty to any one person. He said some of you are from the Apollos camp. Now we learn from this text and from other parts of 1 Corinthians and also from the book of Acts, that Apollos was one of the greatest preachers you could have possibly imagined. He was like a Billy Sunday or like a Billy Graham. He was absolutely amazing. And I, I suppose when you think of Paul, you know, he was a scholarly type. And so he got up and gave kind of, I'm sure, a professorial kind of sermon. But Apollos really brought the house down. He was amazing. And the people that followed Apollos kind of reminds me of kind of the church shoppers today that are always going and looking for a more dynamic minister. Oh, they go to the packing house and they get so enthralled with Ed Reyes. And then they hear about Greg Laurie over in Riverside. Oh, let's go worship over there. But it's almost like worshiping him. And then it's like, oh, he's old hat, but there's something new going on at Sandals. Let's listen to Matt Brown at Sandals. Oh, let's go to Citizens. You know, we know, we know this new guy, Norman. It's just amazing. So everybody starts following all these different people, and it's just like rearranging the deck chairs. It's not like anybody's really coming to Christ. It's just like a bunch of religious groupies following this person and that. See who the next dynamic person is that we're going to follow. And Paul said, it's not all about people. I mean, we know Paul was a decent preacher. I mean, it could be that Apollos was even a better, more enthralling preacher than Jesus. Think about it. I mean, in the text of Scripture, it almost seems like John the Baptist was a better preacher than Jesus. Because the text of Scripture is repeatedly having to deal with John the Baptist. No, he's not the Messiah. He's the one that was pointing to the Messiah. The point isn't how 
great you preach. The point is that you're using your gifts and that everybody points to Jesus because he's the Messiah. You know, for my money and in my opinion, I think the greatest preacher in America is down in San Diego, Miles McPherson. He was a mediocre NFL football player, but he is an amazing preacher. And when I was called to serve a mission agency down in San Diego, and I would travel around the country and around the world during the week, and I'd come home on the weekends, I wanted to hear a great preacher on Sunday morning. So I'd go and listen to Miles McPherson, and thousands of people would respond to him. And he was amazing. But I also think that he creates a, a, a tad bit of a cult of personality in the church. And if anything happens to Miles, the whole church falls apart. That's not what the church is about. The church is about not so much style or programs or music. It's about Jesus. And not only that, Paul tells us, you know, some people are not so much into loyalty or into style. Some people really tend to worship tradition. It's like, we've never done it. You know how to finish that way, the sentence, right? <laughs> that way, right? It's like, it always has to be done this certain way. And it's almost like we make that tradition more important than the one that the tradition is supposed to be pointing to in the first place. And Paul says, don't be such a traditionalist. That's the point that he's making when he talks about Cephas. You know Cephas? What does that mean? Rock, the rock, Peter. And some people would go back and say, well, we're traditionalists. We go back to Peter. Back when I was a pastor in New Jersey, uh, I, did, uh, I hosted an event weekly during Lent that we called Soup and Scripture. And I'd invite all the churches of our community to come to our church and then one congregation would bring a bunch of soup, and then their minister would preach for us in our social hall. And so we would have all these Protestant denominations and the Catholic Church too. Oftentimes the Catholic Church sent their deacon, but on this particular year, they sent the Monsignor. And we were all so happy the Monsignor was there. And so he gets up, and he gives his speech, and he talks about Peter. And as he's talking about Peter, he tells us that Peter was the rock, and upon this rock, Jesus really established his church, and so the Pope is in direct line from Peter, and so everybody needs to follow the Pope. He went on to say that all the Catholic traditions were the right ones and the true ones. And here he was a guest in my home. <laughs> and all the Protestants were sitting there going, Okay, this is interesting. And all the Catholics were like this. <laughs> their faces were red and their heads were down. And they came up to me afterwards and they said, oh, the Monsignor just didn't get the memo, I guess. He didn't realize this is really an ecumenical gathering. You know, we Protestants, Protestants can be the same way. We can just put so much importance on our tradition, that we miss our focus on the one who the traditions are supposed to point to, and that's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And Jesus is the very embodiment of love. And we learn in Scripture that we are to love like Jesus. That's why we come to worship. Because here in worship, we focus on Jesus, and, and as we open God's word, and as we, we consider the truth of, of the message that Jesus has for us, our pre presuppositions, our philosophies, and our attitudes are challenged. Are they not? This is a place where we're supposed to be stirred up by the values of Christ, and begin reflecting those values of Christ in all of our relationships. You know, I had somebody um, say once in a church that was having a bit of disruption, they says, I want my church back because there's those disruptors. I want my church back. And you always know when you have a problem in a church when anybody says, my church. Because this is not my church. And listen, folks, this is not your church. This is Christ's church. 
And Christ calls us to love. And he challenges all those presuppositions and attitudes that we have. And we can go about our week making our business, making our, 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 our lives and, and doing our business and making our money and having our values and, 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 and having various different opinions, but it's here where we focus on Jesus. You know, I know people say, you know, sports are important. And then families will skip worship and then they'll go be involved in sports events. And sports are, are really important, but I mean, really, are they more important than what's going on here? Do you want your child to have a great baseball swing or do you want them to grow up to love everyone always? Honestly, I can think of one of the greatest experiences in my, my um, young life as a father is, is when my num- number one son, 10 years old, was up to bat in baseball. And he was on All-Stars and they had the championship game. And it was, they were one run down in the bottom of the ninth with one runner on and my son up to bat. I mean, this was a pitcher and batter's duel of epic proportion. And everybody was sitting on pins and needles. This was going to decide the championship of all-stars for our region. And my 10-year-old son was there, and he'd swing the bat, and he'd foul it off. He'd swing the bat, he'd foul it off. He had eight fouls on him. And the sky started to grow dark. (laughs) Honestly, it did. And you're not sure whether you're getting ready for Mudville or some victory. And it started to rain. And there was a stir of discussion in the stands. Oh no, are they gonna call the game? What's gonna happen? And in comes a pitch, high and inside. And my son turns on that pitch and cranks around and hits the ball way into the far left center field and over the fence. And the game was over and the victors had won and and they were dancing around. And and the coach and all the kids just took Grant and put him up on on their shoulders. And I'd never seen anything so dramatic in all my life. It was a a moment of, of great exhilaration. It was wonderful. But really, it's only penultimate. It's, it's, it's not the ultimate thing. It's fine, but it's not the best. Now, I think an even better event happened in my life a decade later when my sister, my oldest sister, who has four perfect girls. <laughs> in contrast to my four boys. And she said to me, Steve, you know, your children, your boys have turned out to be so kind and loving. And that's the kind of thing that really matters. That's what this church is about. That's what it ought to be about every day and in every way. It's about love. Everyone. Always. Can't do any better than that, can you? That's why we're here. To really live as the body of Christ. And what God brings together, let nothing tear us under. Let us pray.
you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.